Today we answer some questions we received via email on this episode of The Unapologetic Show, where we defend truth without compromise with Dr. Bobby Conway, the One Minute Apologist. I'm your host, Tim Hall. Bobby, we have received lots of emails over the past few months with questions. And a lot of those emails we've answered already on our channel. And so we, you know, we'll tend to respond and say, you know, check out this answer. If that doesn't answer your question, let us know. And we don't usually hear from them. But every so often we get some really great questions. And we thought we would just do a whole episode answering kind of a few of these questions. So let's dive in. So we got our first question is from Gail. And Gail, uh, I'll just read her whole email because it's great. She says, I'm writing about a friend who says, She is a Christian because Jesus came and stood at the foot of her bed when she was five years old, and then again when she was 20. She does not attend a church and has no interest in the Bible. She said something a few days ago that that really concerns me. She said that she didn't believe that mass murderers and child molesters could go to heaven. I tried to tell her that if they truly repent and accept Jesus as their personal Savior, they will be in heaven, citing the thief on the cross as an example. She said, well, I hope God has a special place for those people in heaven. I don't want them near me. I don't want them. I don't want to be tainted by them. How can I reach her with the truth? So there's a a couple elements here to this question. So it's a really interesting one, but... Let's dive in. Well, we appreciate your question, Gail. I do uh, hear stories like this sometimes where someone has this powerful experience, Mm -hmm, right, that mm -hmm. they profess to have had, but then they don't see their need for a church, and then they criticize what's in the Bible. Right. And so it makes it tough because, you know, I wasn't in the room when this experience happened. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, it could be that this person... uh, absolutely needs some serious discipleship, which yeah. is the obvious point. Uh, so as far as her salvation goes, I, I don't know. God knows the heart. I don't know where all that is. So you can have people who are believers at times, and they say some really off-the-wall stuff, and it's just a mark that they need some discipleship. Right. I think that my advice would be to Gail is her friend open to growing and being discipled, Mm -hmm. or does she feel like that one experience has kind of just positioned her for life and that's all she needs? She's just good to go because I think that she's going to really miss out on a lot. And I think that if she doesn't start getting discipled, then we could start questioning whether or not there's even authentic salvation. So as it relates to these experiences, uh, some people would be um, skeptical of those altogether. Right. Uh, I'm one of those guys that, uh, you know, I think that there are religious experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that there are a lot of people that are misled about them. I think sometimes these powerful experiences happen in our life and we, we try to offer an interpretation, but, you know, we don't really know for sure if that interpretation is yeah. correct. So you think about like God working in your life Uh, It's interesting how much we all speak an interpretation over God's leading on our life. Right. Well, we're just kind of hoping like, you know, God led us out here to start Image Church and that God did this, but we kind of give an interpretation to our life based on the providential experiences. I think in the same way, when people have a powerful religious experience, they seek to overlay it with Mm. a interpretation well, sometimes our interpretations can be wrong. Yeah. One thing that makes me think that the interpretation can be right is when it leads to greater fruit and discipleship. Right. So when someone says, oh, I'm saved because I had this experience, but I hope people that are murderers uh, and prostitutes or whatever, Don't I hope they're not saved. Right. Uh, then it makes me think, that maybe this experience uh, is worth questioning. But nevertheless, I think we have to be careful in questioning it. Uh, We can look at Scripture. We can compare it with Scripture. But this person needs discipleship, Tim. Yeah, well, I I mean, I'll I'll echo. I know that our friend Nabil Qureshi, he cites in his book uh, a few religious experiences, and that seems to be a common thread, particularly among uh, people that come out of Islam or Muslims that find Jesus, that there's usually some sort of dream or experience that comes with that. But it's usually surrounded by, like you said, by um, people 
people that are searching or they're, they're calling out for Jesus or, or there's some sort of religious experience, whether they've, uh, you know, there's some sort of revival happening in their area. So again, like you said, we wouldn't want to discount that. So I, I think in, in kind of classic Bobby fashion, I would agree. Uh, I would want to meet this person where they say, say, yeah, sometimes the idea of mass murders and child molesters really, um, you know, turn us off. Most people aren't willing to say, let's go hang out with some of these people. But then the ultimate question, and I think this person, you know, I think Gail kind of you know, alludes to this, that can they be saved? Like, can they give their life to Jesus? Is there something, uh, you know, preventing them from doing that? And that would be a hard truth, I think, for some of us to swallow. So how should we think about some of that? The Bible is very clear that uh, Jesus paid for all of our sins. Right. And he didn't just say, well, I paid for your small white lies, but not your big lies. Mm. Or I paid for your thoughts of murder, but not your acts of murder. Yeah. Or I paid for your lust, but not for your adultery. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesus pays for our sins. When we believe in him, he becomes our substitute. Yeah. And so I th- want our listeners to understand that when we are saying that we don't want to be around people like that. It's a clear indication that we don't get the gospel mm. and we don't recognize our own sin. Right. Because the truth of the matter is, uh, we should all see ourselves like Paul as the chief of sinners. Right. Like when Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners, it's not like Paul, uh, like here would be a gross uh, black and white interpretation. Yeah. Paul's the worst sinner to ever live. No, Paul apprehended himself mm. as the chief of sinners, right. as we all should. Because when we apprehend ourselves as the chief of sinners, then that makes us a lot less judgy. But when we think, oh, you know what? Because what often happens with the individual that Gail's trying to reach, when somebody says, oh, I just can't imagine hell uh, or, or heaven being for these types of people. Yeah. Well, then what type of people do you imagine heaven being for? And then what do we do? Now we're starting to create the moral standard by which we get right. in and out. Yeah. And that standard often looks like somebody that lives similar to the way we live. Right. But the gospel is for murderers, for adulterers, for pedophilias. Uh, and that's what's so, so wonderful. It doesn't affirm those deeds. Right. In fact, it says they're horrific. That's why Jesus had to die on a cross. But what's so great about the cross is no matter what somebody has done, if they trust that Christ is their savior, those sins can be paid for. So this person clearly doesn't understand the gospel, Mm. nor does this person understand their sin, nor does this person understand the need to grow in some deep discipleship and not live their life according to past experiences alone, but rather to be biblically measured. Well, that, that's an excellent point. And you mentioned Paul and you know some of his terminology, but we know that Paul was responsible for, participated in the murder of Christians before he that's came right. to Christ. And he was you know one of the great saints, wrote a good portion of the New Testament. And so those to, to be able to discount anybody from heaven seems like a misstep, like you're saying. So yeah, hopefully, Gail, that helps you um, maybe start a conversation or continue a conversation conversation uh, with your friend. Excellent question. Let's move to the next one. So uh, this is uh, Rich and Rich says, hello, Bobby, love your channel and your podcast. Thank you, Rich. We appreciate that. Um, I am just now hearing January's episode. So you may have addressed this already. I didn't, uh, and I haven't heard it yet. Okay. So maybe we covered it, but we'll cover it again. I don't think we did. That's why I picked this question. Uh, Almost all my recent readings has made the case that social justice is absolutely not biblical justice. Do you think the two are somehow compatible? So this, we're talking about social justice versus biblical justice. Are there any similarities? Are they compatible? Let's dive in. Well, I mean, a biblical justice would meet the needs of social justice. Okay. It's just social justice in our culture versus social justice biblically mm. can be two different things. I mean, so when we're out trying to show mercy to those who are in need of mercy, um, our ultimate goal is the gospel. Right. I mean, that's the difference. That's what distinguishes the church from the rest of the world. I mean, anybody can do philanthropy. Uh, and not be a Christian, yeah. but philanthropy plus the gospel is Christianity. Mm. Uh, the gospel should be philanthropic. It should reach out to people. Yeah. So what can happen sometimes is you'll get a social justice movement inside the church minus the gospel, mm. and that is not 
at all what we would see in the Bible. And this often turns out to be very liberal forms of Christianity, yeah. where people go out and they're caring for the poor or they're doing different things to help the community around them. Mm. But they think that that's all we need to do is just meet the earthly needs. But we also have a deeper need to be reconnected to God. But then you get other people that they don't even make a difference in the community. They're not that salt and light. They just preach the gospel, and yeah. they think that's all we need to do is just preach the gospel. Well, the gospel is meant to be preached, but when it gets a hold of us, it's meant to be lived. Right. And as it's lived, it continues to preach through our words and through our actions. So I think as Christians, we should absolutely be engaged in social justice. Mm. But as we do it, we need to make sure that social justice is a means and the gospel is the end. We want everybody to ultimately come to know Christ. We want to be, we, and we should not be outdone in philanthropy right. by the world or by a liberal progressive church. Mm -hmm. Sadly, churches get so passionate about doctrine. That's not the sad point. The sad point is when they get so passionate about doctrine that they forget to be devoted to displaying their doctrine in their everyday actions. Yeah. I think one of the things that I would uh, you know, love to get your insight on is I think sometimes the word justice is kind of has this definer. It's kind of like the by which standard. And so if, if the by the which standard is the society, what the society wants or what the society deems as good, then it can start to get really skewed. Instead, if we're looking at um, Scripture, what this by what by what standard it's the nature of God as delivered to us uh, through Scripture, then when we're working with society, we're looking at by what standard, and that's the scriptural standard. So we can still do justice in society in that sense, but the standard isn't judged merely by what's going on in society. The standard is judged by what's revealed in scripture through God's nature. Yeah. So take critical race theory, for example. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are passionate about it. In fact, it's going to split a lot of the church off, mm. unfortunately, because people don't realize that that's a theory. And that theory is broken. Yeah. Uh, that theory is um, a melding together of postmodern deconstruction and Marxist ideology. Right. And when you put that together, a lot of people, hey, they're just paying attention to critical race theory. Well, what can I come in? That it wants to get rid of racism. That's, mm. that's great. But the solution's all wrong. Yeah. Because all it's going to do is... Fast forward 50 years down the road, now you're going to have a new oppressed class, and it's going to be the white community. Right. And then the white community is going to have to overturn because they're going to be the oppressed class, yeah. and then they're going to overthrow it, and then they're going to be back in this spot. And so this is, uh, it, it's, it's absurd. Yeah. What we need is biblical justice, and what we need is biblical solutions to racism, and that's where the cross really helps us to understand there's neither uh, Jew nor Gentile, right. right? That we are all one in Christ Jesus. So we should get our applications from Scripture, not from deconstruction and Marxism. We can learn from those things, but I cannot emphasize enough to our listeners, we have no idea what we're asking for if we're going to swallow the pill of critical race theory right. in full. So what are some things, you know, kind of we'll, we'll round this question out before we get to our last question. What are some things that you think um, the church should be doing that maybe would be judged as um, kind of fulfilling that need of social justice based on the biblical standard, based on the biblical principles that we're not doing right now? Mm -hmm. If you're going to be critical of the church and say, well, I think we've, we, we, we should be doing this, this, and this, and, and we're not doing it right now, at least not effectively. We're not, people aren't seeing that in the way mm -hmm. that um, we would like them to be able to, to, be, to be seen as Jesus. Well, I mean, I think a couple things. Uh, for example, taking Image Church, uh, you yeah. know, where I serve as lead pastor, I would say one of the things that I tried to put in place, Tim, and you've been doing this with me as our associate pastor, is the Race and Gospel series. Yeah. Like, we are pulling together people in the community. Uh, this 
particular weekend, we have an African-American pastor Mm -hmm. and we're going to dialogue together. He's lead pastor of a church. And we just thought, what would it be like to have two lead pastors get together and have a conversation, one white, one black, and show that we can be united. So we're doing that. We're we're having discussions Mm -hmm. in small groups together. So that's one thing that we're doing to address uh, the the issue of race in our culture, uh, equipping our church. Another thing is mental health is an issue uh, where people need mercy and we can reach out. And so we're trying to offer mental health ministries. And as you know, we've led small groups and, uh, and done different things to address that need. I think another thing that we could do is just be aware of what are the major justice issues of our times. Yeah. And so just identify those and then come up with a strategy. So we're if you're pro-life, which I hope you are, mm-hmm. uh, figure out what you're going to do. Like we haven't done it yet, but we will partner with... Um, Love life in right. Charlotte uh, to you know advance that piece. And we can go out and pray, and we can go right. out and march in the city. So identify the major social justice issues in your area. Uh, pray about getting involved. You don't even have to do it from your church. You can find another local ministry in the area, connect yeah. with them, yeah. and be a part of it. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Awesome. Well, Rich, hopefully that answers your question. And thank you for tuning in. And hopefully as you get caught up with the back catalog, you'll get to this episode and uh, your question will be answered. So uh, we got one more here. So Brian asks, my prayer and hope is that you can help me where I'm struggling with a sense of spiritual warfare or the flesh or just temptation from the devil himself. I have had people doubting their faith in God and sharing with me their concerns on how to prove the Bible is reliable or God's word. Leaving God's existence um, and also proof of the resurrection showing God came down from heaven to earth to save us. Are there any resources or messages that can help me in uh, my aching soul to answer these questions? Uh, Is it wrong that I'm questioning. So this guy seems like he's in doubt. So Brian's in a little bit of doubt. He's kind of wondering um, what path he should take forward on, you know, knowing the Bible is reliable, knowing that God is, God exists, the resurrection. So how would you uh, approach some of these things here in, a, in just a few minutes? Well, we've got about eight minutes, so we're going to have to stretch this one out, right. <laughs> unless you got some other questions. <laughs> nope, this, this is all, this okay. is all this is the last one. So. <laughs> uh, I'm laughing at, with Tim now because, you know, when you do radio, uh, you've got to go to the end. You just can't stop the radio show shy. And so I'm realizing that Tim's got this last question. So we are going to have fun just stretching this out. We're going to stretch it out. All right. So let's talk uh, first and foremost about doubts. Yeah. Okay. In the book of Jude, uh, we we hear this phrase, be merciful to those who doubt. Mm. That's a great a great reminder. And so, uh, who is the person that's writing into us? Uh, his name is Brian. So, Brian, <clears throat> I love the heartbeat of Scripture, to be merciful to those who doubt. Yeah, There are those who I would say are, um, they love their doubts. They celebrate their doubts. They want to find out more doubts so that they can move beyond their faith. Yeah. But Brian's not coming off this way. He mm-hmm. sounds like he's sincerely just struggling with some doubts. Yeah. And it's not that he wants to move beyond his faith. He wants to go deeper in his faith. Mm. And I want to say, you know, Brian, you're not alone in your doubts. I experienced a horrific season for several years of yeah. doubts where I thought I was going to be an apostate, or I should say I feared I was going to be an apostate. Yeah, I can remember driving um, down a road and I felt as if... I was hanging by literally a strand, Mm. feeling like at any moment that strand's going to snap and I'm going to be an apostate. And I hated the thought of it. I just wanted God to hold me on. But I did not know how my faith could hold together. It didn't seem coherent. What happens with doubts is something comes and disrupts our coherence Mm. in our faith, and our faith no longer coheres. It's not making sense. It's not resonating. And many people jump ship too early uh, because they think, oh, well, I just can't trust this. And I think God can really use our doubts to deepen us, to strengthen us, to sanctify us. And so I would encourage you, Brian, to make sure that you identify what your biggest doubts are, Mm -hmm. what's really eating at you. And identify those and then kind of force rank them. 
tackle them, if it's, you know, why the Bible is trustworthy, or did Jesus rise from the dead? Some of these things, if you're just you know, experiencing some uh, disturbia, so to speak, right. just write that stuff down. And then you can start pursuing your answers. But at the end of the day, I would say, I found in my own life that apologetics was helpful to a point. Yeah, Because what can happen is, is when you're doubting, if you're not careful, um, you can start putting yourself as kind of the authority over Scripture, mm, Yeah. okay? And so you see yourself as the authority over Scripture versus the, versus the Scripture being your authority. Right. And what happens is you chase one doubt down, but you're always looking for the next one. Yeah. And there has to come a point for the Christian where they renegotiate their faith stance and they're not always looking for doubts. Uh, they become like a child. They trust God. And for me, I still have a ton of questions, but they don't create all the panic, Tim, right. that they once did. I just trust that there's an answer. I've been through the Q&A process enough to know that if I've got questions, there's going to be an answer. Right. I just have to trust and rest and not lose my heart of worship in the midst of it. Well, and you've talked several times about different types of doubt, emotional yeah. doubt, intellectual doubt, you know, so there's, so I would be, you know, I, if I was t- talking to Brian here, I would say, maybe try to figure that out as well as you're kind of writing that stuff down, kind of point. put those in different categories. And that will then help you if it's more an, an emotional thing, where did that come from? Maybe it's seeing a, a talking to a pastor or a counselor. If it's an intellectual thing, going through the back catalog of one minute apologist videos or checking out some other channels or, you know, reading some apologetics books might be the path forward. So, you know, trying to adjudicate what what's the genesis of that I think is really important. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the by far the most kind of doubt that people struggle with is emotional doubts. Yeah. Uh, you know, losing a loved one, uh, watching the suffering in the world. Uh, then there's a volitional doubt that I talk about. This is kind of a battle of the wills. Yeah. Jonah takes off, goes the opposite direction, right. head down to Joppa. He's doubting. Uh, it's a volitional battle yeah. uh, that he's doubting God uh, could have a real purpose there uh, for Nineveh that Jonah agrees with, yeah. <laughs> right? He knows that God's a good God and he's going to spare them. And Jonah doesn't like that. <laughs> yeah. Jonah, uh, you know, is kind of like Gail's friend, yeah, right? Similar, uh, yeah. yeah, there's some similarities there. Now, as it relates to uh, another type of doubt, it's intellectual doubt. And this is, you know, the smallest type of doubt that people struggle yeah. with. Uh, but it's very powerful when it affects people. This was what barraged me the most. Yeah. Um, I was reading so many books and I just could not process. For every book I read to trace track down an answer to a question, I came up with 10 other books that I needed to read. Right. So the snowball grew and grew and grew and grew. And I finally had to come to a place where I realized getting the next answer to my question is not the ultimate solution. Yeah. I need an encounter with God. And you know, Thomas Aquinas, the great 13th century philosopher, he had such a powerful encounter with God after writing just tons of work encounter was so powerful. He put down his pen, never wrote again. And he says, all I have written is but straw. So here, this great apologist philosopher had this powerful moment that was more convincing than everything he ever wrote. Made it so much that everything he wrote in comparison was like straw. Wow. Yeah, that's a powerful story. Well, Brian, thank you so much for the question. Uh, I hope that Bobby's answer, even though we didn't go into the specifics, will help uh, you realize that you can identify that Bobby has gone through those uh, same questions uh, process that you have, and that we have provided several resources that will give you um, really great details on hoping that you can answer some of those questions for you. Uh, so check the back catalog for some of those. And again, we just thank you for uh, sending in your email questions. If you have questions, you can email them to ask at one minute apologist.com. And maybe in a future episode, we will answer those. And you can also contact Bobby on Pastor's Perspective, That's Tuesdays, right. Wednesdays, and Thursdays. You can call in to that, check out their YouTube channel as well. Uh, and that, that radio show's on K-Wave. You can call in and just ask him right one-on-one. So if you got questions <laughs> and you don't want to email in and you want an answer super quick, go ahead and, and give him a call. And, That's right. And Bobby and his team will help you uh, do that on Pastor's Perspective perspective. So with that, we thank you for checking this video out. Subscribe, like this video, and we'll see you next time on The Unapologetic Show.